Good morning, everyone. We're reading today from Luke 20, uh, starting at 27 to 39, and can be found on 1056 of the Church Bible. Some of the seducers who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first, she married a man who died childless. The second and the th then the third married her. And in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, all the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, the people of the age of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are the, go the God's children since the since there are no children of the resurrection, but in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for in him, for to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded. Well, said teacher, no one dare ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to ask Charles to come and speak now. Let me pray for you, brother, before we start. Father, we do thank you for your holy word. We ask, Lord, that as we receive from it today, that you'll help us to give due attention to it. And we pray for our brother Charles. We thank you for him. And we pray, Lord, that by your spirit you will anoint him, that you would take the words that he's prepared, and that you'll speak to our hearts through them. We ask, Lord, that you will challenge us, that you'll feed us, that you'll inspire us. In Jesus Christ's name. Thank you, sir. Well, good morning, church. Awesome. The Bible says that let everyone who has breath, let him praise the Lord. Let us begin initially by praising God this morning. To him, to whom belongs all glory and all honor. To him who belongs all power and all authority. Let us bow before him this morning and give him thanks and praise. The Bible says he sits atop the circle of the universe. He has made darkness his clothing. He flies on the wings of the wind. He has made time. He has taken a chunk of eternity and called it time. But he's beyond time. Whatever has troubled you this morning before coming to church, let us lay to the feet of our Savior, King Jesus, this morning. Because he says we are more than conquerors. This word sounds so interesting. Do we take time out to really understand what these words mean? It means we can do almost anything through him who gives us the power. So whether you've been ill, whether you've heard some terrible news this morning, whether you've had a fight with your spouse, whether some child has driven you almost crazy, 
When you come to church this morning, expect the power of the living God to move in your life. Bring whatever those issues are to the feet of Jesus. Because the Christian faith is a faith or a religion of power. Of power. I was watching something recently, and this ex-Satanist was giving his testimonial of what it means to be a Christian. He said every other religion, they were able to penetrate, confuse them. He said the only time they have difficulty is when they go there, real Christians, that there seems to be barriers, that they keep hitting this wall, they can't get through. He was testifying that the only true, quote-unquote, religion is the Christian faith. That is our faith, ladies and gentlemen. And we would do well to remember it. It's not about attending church, ladies and gentlemen. It's about living in power, pressing in, to who this awesome God is and his son. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We are all free. This morning, we are all free. Our message today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 20, verse 27 to verse 38. And I've titled this The Resurrection Riddle. But let us begin initially with some contextual setting and a little bit of background relating to this message. Our Lord Jesus had now arrived in Jerusalem and in a variety of ways demonstrating himself to be the true Messiah. A number of people had received him gladly, but no one understanding fully who he was or the implications of his coming. Jesus' cleansing of the temple and his daily possession of it for teaching and ministry was viewed as a serious threat to the authority and positions of the Jewish leaders who had already proposed to put Jesus to death. But when they challenged Jesus' authority, Jesus' authority, Jesus became even more outspoken against these people. The parable of the vineyard and the vine growers, which we find in Luke 20, 9 to 18, for example, gives us some more information. This was a painful blow to them, for it not only identified Jesus as the Son of God sent by the Father, but it revealed these people as God's enemies who would be destroyed only to be replaced by the Gentiles. Also. Before their position or opposition was, before it was nothing personal. Now it was something really personal because they are being threatened. They wanted to arrest Jesus on the spot, but the masses will not allow it. They thus implemented a multi-pronged plan to have Jesus arrested and put to death by Rome. So a little bit of background information and context there. However, since the, faith, since the failed coup to trap Jesus in a political question failed, when they asked him, just a little bit, a few verses behind, when they asked him about paying tax, See, one of the things I love about Jesus is the way he disarms you by his answers. I have studied so many different passages where I scratch my head. How would I have known what to do in a situation like this? And Jesus comes up from nowhere, bang, and you're just left amazed, blown away by his answers. This is one of those. They try to trap him a few verses below by asking him, about whom should they pay taxes to? Okay? A truly political question. 
And if you remember, he told them whose inscription, whose image is on the coin or the denarius. And they said, Caesar. He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. What an answer. So that trap did not work, okay? Because that was a big trap. It didn't work, okay? Now they are plotting again. How are we going to get them? How are we going to get them? They denied the possibility of the bodies of the dead ever being raised again. So they sought by an extreme illustration to bring the doctrine of resurrection to appear to make it look ridiculous. You see, the Sadducees definitely did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They considered it to be a ridiculous idea. For anybody to even think for a moment that bodies can come back to life, on the other side of the grave. How ridiculous can that be? If this were to be true, what about people who were committed? What about people who had been eaten by wild animals? What about people who the crocodile had swallowed or the sharks had bitten in half or swallowed? How would they get their bodies back if this was true? They figured in their intelligent mind. We've got him this time. Now, this poor woman, who has been passed on to seven separate husbands, whose wife would she be at the resurrection? This is why this is such a ridiculous and nonsensical thing to imagine or believe. The whole idea of a bodily resurrection is ridiculous. Isn't that right, Jesus? They're posing it to him. You see, people have all through the ages found it hard to believe in the resurrection of the dead. And for the same reason that the Sadducees found it hard to believe in the resurrection of the dead. Because we tend to assume that what is to come will be some sort of continuation of what is. That assumption is at the heart of the Sadducees' story. If you understand the nature of Old Testament marriages, you will realize that the question about the woman is technically one about property rights. And the other is about life after death. That's really what's at the heart of these questions. A question. This woman had been the property of seven different men. This is a poor woman. Just imagine that. Whose property will she be at the resurrection of the dead? Jesus says she will not or she wouldn't be anybody's property. Why not? Because things are going to be a whole lot different when we get to heaven. Now the Sadducees, like the Pharisees, just a little bit about these groups of people, so we understand. This was a group, if you will, that grew or developed within Judaism around the second century BCE. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not. <laughs> Usually when you hear the word Sadducees, it's, you know, we tend to have this job of sad, you see. Sad, you see. So when I hear the word Sadducees, sad, you see, sad people. The Sadducees were conservative aristocratic group, many of them dignitaries in the priesthood. They believed that collaborating with Rome was the best strategy for preserving Israel's identity. This is according to E.J. Tinsley, a gentleman I was reading a little bit about his point of view. It is interesting that Luke identifies them by what they do not believe. Chapter 20, verse 27. This raises a great question. 
Do we ever come to our Savior, to our Lord Jesus, leading with what we are not prepared to give up, with what we are not prepared to do, or what we will never, ever believe, no matter what? How do we come to Jesus when we say we are in Christ? How really do we come to our Lord Jesus Christ? Do we tell him, for example, it's all right, I don't mind being a Christian. I don't mind being born again. But don't tell me to give up my booze. Don't force me to give up my tobacco or my drugs. Don't tell me to give up my women. Don't tell me to stop lying. Don't tell me to stop cheating. Don't tell me to stop being a racist. Don't tell me to stop being prejudiced. Don't tell me what to do. I don't mind being born again, but that's as far as it goes. Don't tell me to give up anything. Is that how we come to our Lord Jesus Christ? Do we present him and give him everything, or do we hold a few things back and say, this bit I am keeping, it's mine. Just something for us to ponder. I'll follow your ethical teachings, Lord, but I will not buy into any pie-in-the-sky Christian dogma or fantasies or any f- funny teaching like Noah, funny teachings, like, which is the one that was swallowed by the whale? Yeah. Jonah, don't tell me about all these funny stories, I don't believe all that stuff. And don't tell me there is more beyond this life, because this is all I can see. This is my reality. When you are dead, you are six foot under, and that's the end of it. I don't mind doing my bit by contributing to missions field. I'll give a fiver here or there. I'll send five pounds to some of those poor people in Africa or in Asia or in India. Or I don't mind doing all that stuff. I don't even mind inviting you to my home, Lord, but only if you come without expecting any sacrifices or expecting me to do anything or change. <sighs> Jesus entered into Jerusalem. In Luke 19, 28. And ever since then, opposition had been intensifying against him. The only reason the chief priests, scribes, and leaders of the people had not yet seized him was because of his popularity with the people. They now sent spies who act honestly, but whose goal is to trap Jesus. Death and taxes. These are two topics they broach with him. First, they tried to trap him with a question about taxes, which didn't work. And now in our text, some Sadducees are trying to trap him yet again with a question about resurrection. They don't really mean it. They just want to get him into trouble. Now, a contemporary version of their question has probably entered the minds of many of us or many people whose spouses have died and who have then remarried. They must have thought about this at some point. Will I see my ex-spouse or my deceased spouse? Will I see them in heaven? Their version is based on Moses' teaching in Deuteronomy 25, verse 5 to 10. Where the Mosaic law stipulates that a woman whose husband dies before having fathered a son with her must marry his brother and keep on trying. Why? Any son or sons that resulted would belong to brother number one. Even if they married brother number five and they have a son or sons, sons, if they are focused on sons, not girls, just sons, that will be for husband number one. This was a way of preventing husband number one's name from being blotted 
from Israel. Now, Brandon Bine, in his very helpful book entitled The Hospitality of God, a reading of Luke's gospel, he points out that the Sadducees' questions seek to make life after death ridiculous. It rests on a crass assumption that life after death will simply be a repetition or extension of this present life with the same conditions applying. Jesus offers a two-stage clarification. Number one, in the risen life, we are dealing with a totally new situation. Since no one dies anymore, there is no more need for procreation. And hence, there will be no need for marriage. The same Moses who wrote the prescription also cites in Deuteronomy in a far more central passage of God being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which you find in Exodus 3.6. This description implies the continuing personal existence of those with whom God remains in relationship, including the three patriarchs we just, I just mentioned. The relationship God seeks to forge with us human beings in the here and now is one that will transcend death. Jesus' answer is that the resurrection life is not this life all over again. It is a new existence in which we participate in God's eternity. God told Moses that he was the God of his forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The in-your-face message to the Sadducees is this. Your own tradition implies that the dead still live. For us, the good news is that our lives, after we invite Jesus' resurrecting presence in, is not this life all over again, either. It is a new existence in which we participate in God's eternity. They no longer dare to ask him any other question. This message, however, focuses on our need to prepare for Jesus' advent, for his entry into human life, into our lives. If you've ever seen the tombs of any of the great pharaohs, some of you may have had interest in looking this up or reading about this historically, you will know that all pharaohs, household, and servants were buried with him or with the pharaoh. So that when life started off again on the other side, everybody will be able to resume their respective roles. If they were cooks, they remained cooks. If they were cleaners and concubines, they maintained the same status. For what was is now and shall be evermore. However, if you are king in this life, then you will move on as king into the next. If a slave, then a slave. And so many believe that. If you did well in this life, then you will go on doing well in the next life. That's what makes the whole idea of reincarnation such an attractive concept to so many. It's all logically connected. If you own property in this life, be it a car or a house or a woman, <laughs> then with any luck, you'll find that property waiting for you in some form or another on the other side. As I begin to round up, Jesus challenges all of this. The new world that is coming, he teaches, is not like this world we know at all. It's just not a continuation of this life as we know it, with all its structures and traditions intact. On the contrary, the new world is a complete revolution, 
And we need to begin to get comfortable with that idea. Where the first will become the last, and the last will become the first. Where death itself has been completely abolished. And where even the most precious God-given institutions of all, marriage and family, will be a thing of the past. Jesus says, no, no, no. The kingdom that is coming will be so unlike anything you and I have experienced here on earth that you will barely recognize yourself. The whole world is going to be recreated. And the body is going to be recreated because we will assume this a new celestial body. A body that can no longer be ill, can no longer be sick or ravaged by cancer or any other debilitating illness. A pure body, a body that can go through walls, a body that can travel millions of miles in nanoseconds. A totally new body is what the Lord has promised us that we are going to inherit. The whole world is going to be recreated and the body will also be recreated. And we are all going to relate to each other in an entirely new and powerful way. I guess the key question for us to ponder this morning, how have you allowed Jesus into your life? What have you decided to drop at his feet and say, Lord, I will drop all and follow you? Because what I love so much about our Lord is that the plans he has for us are plans of good and not of evil. They are plans with a hope and plans with an expected end. Ephesians 3.20 tells us that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above. All that we dare to think are beyond our highest desires, dreams, and expectations that he can do a thousand times more for us. So isn't it worth it for us to say, Father, I come to you, Lord, I bow before your throne and I present my body to you as a living sacrifice. Show me how to serve you more, how to become all you've created me to be. Show me how to represent you. Help me be your arms, your legs, your mouthpiece, your eyes in this current materiality, in this current world. Show me how I can be all I can be for you. Let people see Jesus in me when they encounter me. How are you at work? Do people see Jesus in you when you're working? Or do they run away when they see you coming? Do you bring sunshine with you? Or do you bring clouds and darkness with you when you show up? Do they see the beauty of the Lord in you? in your smile, in your countenance, in your welcoming? Or do they run away? Are you really upholding the awesome Christian faith where you go? Or do they say, this is what a Christian looks like? I don't want to know anything about Christianity. That's the truth, you see. It's not about attending church. It is about being Jesus to the people in the world. Do you lead hear them say touch wood or knock on the wood or whatever or touch wood do you join them in touching wood because that's superstition I've seen so many Christians do the same thing touch wood and they look for the nearest wood to touch because the wall says that they are saying it too Christians lead we don't follow because we know the truth and we know the way we lead and others follow us we don't follow other people we are difference makers we are the light and salt of the earth. Let us remember that. The Lord bless you. Thank you.